You will not believe this next story. And it starts with a simple phone call, a call no one wants to get. Your child has been in a terrible accident. That is the call Joyce Smith received about her son, John. But that is only where their dramatic story begins. It has been almost two years since first responders pulled the lifeless body of John Smith from the bottom of Lake St. Louise. This is the first time they have met at the scene, recounting what happened that fateful day. So directly behind me, about 30 to 40 yards out is where the, the hole in the ice was. John and his two best friends were hanging out at this park when they decided to walk on the frozen lake, not realizing the danger. The ice gave way, plunging them into the icy water. John's lungs began to fill with water. He was drowning. And we were actually starting to take on water as we were climbing out there because the ice was actually starting to sink around us. There's one child underwater now. Rescuers were in a race against time as they searched the murky water for John. At the point that we found him, so he'd been underwater for at least 15 minutes. The moment we got him out of the water, John was lifeless. With all harsh reality, he was dead at that point. They fought to revive him with CPR and advanced life support. When it takes 10, 15, 20 minutes to remove somebody that's not breathing, that does not have a pulse, that's underwater for, for that long, um, it's grim. Joyce received the call that no parent wants to get. There had been an accident at the lake. John's friends were okay, but John had drowned and rescuers were unable to get a pulse. My heart was just, it felt like it weighed a ton. Joyce rushed to the emergency room. She had no idea John's brain had been without oxygen for nearly an hour. I had begged God all the way over, please don't take my son. He was gone. I mean, he was, I've never felt someone that cold in my life. We were at the point where everyone was beginning to discuss stopping efforts and, and pronouncing him dead um, when his mother, mother had arrived to the hospital. So she comes in and, uh, you know, beside herself, obviously, you know, she's, she's looking at her poor son who's, who's dead. An anguished mother cried out a prayer to save her son. She came on in here, walked in, sat down and yelled out, come Holy Spirit. No one expected what would happen next. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joyce and John Smith. <laughs> Joyce has chronicled her journey in the new book, The Impossible, the miraculous story of a mother's faith and her child's, her child's resurrection. And also joining us is their pastor, John Noble. Thank you all so much for being here. Joyce, where we left off in that piece was they were about to call it they were about to pronounce John dead. Yes. And brought you into the room where a six foot seven man had been doing CPR on him for the better part of an hour. Yeah. Tell the audience what you did when you walked in there. When I first walked in there, I couldn't believe how many people were in the room. There were probably at least 25 professionals in there that had been working on John. And so I, didn't realize that they were getting ready to call time of death. So I went and sat down and in my peripheral vision, I saw um, a doctor walking back and forth and he kept looking at me. I kept thinking, you know, why is he staring at me like that? Finally came over and he sat down or squatted down next to me and he said, uh, Joyce, if you want to, you can walk up and talk to your son, which I thought was kind of a strange request, you know? So I walked up to the end of his bed and the young man that had been, was still doing CPR on him, you could tell that he was just really frantically working on my son. He had perspiration on his brow and his smock was just covered in perspiration because he's working on him so hard. And they were wanting me to see how much they had done for him to save him before they told me, you know, that they were, he was dead. But I walked up to him and I got a hold of his feet, which was pretty much the only thing was uncovered because they were tr covered him with a huge bear hugger to warm his body. Because there was a comment they make that you're not dead until you're warm and dead. And when they brought him in, he was only 88 degrees. And so they had warmed him up to that point. It was like 96 degrees. So I knew when I got up and I touched his feet and they were gray and they were cold that this was time to be desperate, you know, and so, I got a hold of his feet and I was like, I don't want to let my son go. And so I started praying. I'd heard this all my life. The Holy Spirit, the race Christ Jesus from the, 
from the dead. You know, that's what I came through my mind. And I reached down and I hold, held on to his feet and I started praying, please, Holy Spirit, come and give me back my son. And the nurse who was there, and she'd been working with John for the whole time since he'd been in there, she started saying, I have a pulse, I have a pulse, I have a pulse. She was so stunned because for all the time they'd been doing the CPR, they had nothing and they had given up totally and now they have a pulse and other people saying, we have the pulse too. And so they start frantically working on him. Even the medical staff has been using the word miracle, yes. miracle to describe what happened there that day. Before it happened, before you got there, called on the Holy Spirit, uh, about an hour earlier, John, you had been out on the ice in Missouri. You're not, you don't have a lot of frozen lakes there, you say, but no, it was of interest to you. You were 14 years old. You've been talking to your mom literally seconds before you went through the ice. Do you remember being in the water and what that was like? Yes, and the best way I can tell you what I was doing is I took this from my brothers and I walk and talk. When I'm on the phone, I have to be doing something, something with my hands, but usually I'm walking. And when I was on the phone with my mom, I was walking farther and farther out. And one of my pals, Josh Rieger, was right behind me. And I hung up, I said, I love you, mom. And as I hit, you know, the red phone saying, hang up, the ice cracked and the three of us fell in. Do you remember that feeling of being in the icy water? After I got home, the nightmare started to come, you know, after all the medication wore off. And, you know, I can remember some of the screams of us screaming, I don't want to die, call 911. Oh God, please help us. Um, the burning sensation of the water and our skin being cut by the ice. You know, waking up and sweating because I can remember it so graphically. It was, I needed God and it was a desperate time mm -hmm. and our lives were on the line and we knew that. And I know, Pastor, you've been with them from the beginning. Yeah. The, the, John was on the, he was on the ice shelf, yes. um, which, any in in a, if there had been a wave, he could have gone under that ice. And exactly. He Even would not have been recovered. Even if the first responders would have moved just differently, he was right on the edge. And if they, he would have went right under the ice, then it would have been a completely. It would have, he wouldn't have made it. Mm -hmm. And he also happened to go in where there was a rock bottom that was about ten feet deep, as opposed to a mud bottom and much deeper, right. which would have changed the likely recovery scenario as well. Joyce, I know when you got there, you, after John came back. It was unclear what kind of John we would have. Right. And you refused to have any negative talk around him. Yes. You only had life talk. Yes. Was that just positive thinking, or did you actually believe at the time John would return to this young man as opposed to someone who had been severely brain injured? I had no doubt that he was going to return exactly like he was. Um, Power of life and death is in the tongue is what scripture in Proverbs 18:21, And it talked about that and it's something I had learned long ago. And so when the doctors told us that John was not going to be, well, first of all, that he wasn't going to live through the night. And second of all, if he lived because he was without oxygen as long as he had been, that he would probably be a vegetable. I just refused to believe that and I, told him that very bluntly when I, I said, I hear you're the best, so you do your job and God will take care of the rest. And I told him and said, there will be absolutely no negative talk around him whatsoever. And we guarded that, yeah. we guarded that, didn't yes, we? we? Did. That he couldn't say anything like he was saying to me in the room. John, when you started to recover, because you know the audience should know, you, you walked out of that hospital. <laughs> You walked out of that hospital. What, what did you take away from the experience? Here you, here you were 14, you're 17 now. What was the lesson in it for you? Cherish every moment you have with your family. We're not promised tomorrow. You know, I, uh, every night before I go to bed, my dad walks up to my door, he pops it open and he says, I love you, son. And I say, I love you, dad. I go every night before I go to bed or brush my teeth, I go in and give mom a kiss on her cheek and a hug. After every phone call with my brothers, we say, I love you. You know, it's just the small things, you know, cherish every moment you have, do everything to the best of your abilities and give honor to God. Absolutely. And something just to remind us all of the power of community and family yes. and faith in a world that sometimes seems too dark. God bless you and you and you. Thank you all so much for being here. 
Joyce's book, The Impossible, The Miraculous Story of a Mother's Faith and Her Child's Resurrection, is available now. Hello today, fans. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking that button down there and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives.